we worship your holy name because when we call upon your name you answer thank you father because you are with us always Lord may we remain with you even in our thoughts may we remain with you in the things of our passion may we remain with you passionate about being with you O oh God passionate about the things that you say May we be with you, O oh God, because you are with us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Let's be seated, everybody. God bless you. Thank you so much. God is good. Hallelujah. I hope you sang all your songs. We did. Yeah, God is good. All righty. Come on. God is good. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Woo! God is good. All right, all righty. So tonight, by the grace of God, we will examine some truths that actually have, in a way, I would say, the ability to more readily transform us. The truth of the Word of God is transformative. The truth of the Word of God has the power to turn you into a new creation. The truth of the Word of God in the working of the Anointed One or through the working of the Anointed One and His Holy Spirit, the truth of the Word of God is able to change and to transform. However, tonight, either by application or just by nature, certain things have a more, they, they seem to be more potent when it comes to ready transformation. And I'm going to be sharing one of those things to, with you today, and it might even be more than one. And the first one is going to come from the book of Psalms 139. So if you would go with me to the book of Psalms 139, and did someone just giggle like they read it before they left the house? It, it happens. And it's not even a coincidence. It's because the Lord was preparing you for it. You know, myself and Tia were having a conversation earlier on about coincidences. Are there really coincidences? You know? But I don't, I don't think there are because the Bible says that God has written concerning you in the volume of his books. And so it might look like a coincidence from your standpoint, um, but it, it never is. So Psalms 139 verse 7, and it goes like this. Where can I hide or where can I go from your spirit? Verse 11 says, if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me. Even the night shall be light about me. Isn't this awesome? Praise the Lord. And just if you're wondering what we're talking about earlier, Ti is in verse 16, wherein the Bible says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. I want to encourage somebody here tonight 
who may have read in the book of Hebrews, wherein it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things yet to be seen. And there are times wherein when you read such a declaration from the Word of God, when you come in contact with the display of such light and wonder, you feel sometimes intimidated rather than energized. And the reason being that you may not feel adequate in your faith journey. You may not feel like you have faith. So I, I want to encourage you today to recognize that even that faith that is yet to form in you, heaven, your heavenly father can regard that faith that you have not yet had. A couple of months ago, I did say to you that... Um, Jesus says, as I am, so are you. And the Bible says he is the one that is, that was, and is to come. He's the one that is, that was, and is to come. I like the fact that he is first described as the one that is before he was said to be the one that was. Very significant, you know, because whenever you encounter him, he is all there is. Hallelujah. So the Bible says, Jesus speaking, as I am, so are you. So if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, if Jesus is the one that is, the one that was, and the one that is to come, then it is very possible for you to be today what you are to become. You can leverage that you that is more mature, that you that is more trusting in God from tomorrow because these dimensions are accessible to the ones who believe. But to believe, you must first of all be aware that there are actually dimensions. So when you know that truth, you will no longer be intimidated by any situation or circumstance. Because I understand that you are a man who is in time and a woman who is still in time. And so line has to be upon line. Precept has to be upon precept. But there are such graces for acceleration wherein you can be that man of tomorrow today. Because why? The Bible says that the eyes of the father the creator and the lover of your soul has seen your very substance before you were formed. While you were yet unformed, he was able to see you. And so while your faith that is supposed to be the substance of the things that you hope for is still trying to find its feet and its bearing, you can still believe for things that require mature faith. And I hope that would encourage somebody to stop focusing on their faith level and be focused more on God's goodness level. You know, because sometimes if you just want to receive only that which your faith can carry, you would only limit yourself to your own progress. Um, you, you, your, your, the, the, the fullness of your life will be measured by your own ability to believe Whereas there are certain times wherein on the springboard of the mercy of God, you can actually receive more than you are able to believe. Now, I know that is contrary to someone's theology, you know, because some people are like, well, the Bible says, you know, believe and you shall receive. And so if you don't believe, you will not receive. What I'm saying is the substance has to be there. You have to have something. You have to believe. But that doesn't mean you're only going to get to the measure of what you believe. How much did you believe before God gave you Jesus? The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I don't wait until my children are able to believe that I can do stuff for them before I do it for them because of the fact that it is not just left to them, it is also up to me to demonstrate my love toward them. And so I want you to set yourself free from any limitations that is as a vir that, that is as a function of your current current growth level and open up yourself by faith again by faith to believe that you can receive of his fullness because the bible did not say of your fullness have you received the bible says of his fullness have you received grace for grace that means i can receive grace to have more grace i can receive by faith to have more faith when Jesus told his disciples what things were to happen, 
and they will begin to, uh, they started to feel inadequate within themselves. What did they say? They said, Lord, increase our faith. And so if your faith is yet unformed, it doesn't mean God cannot see it. He sees it. But let's just quickly go back to verse 11, which was where we actually originally came to. The Bible says, if I say surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Verse 7 says, where can I go from God's love? Where can I hide from his face? Where exactly can I hide from his face? What did I tell you? I'm, 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 in, I'm intent on sharing with you tonight. It, it, and that which I told you was that there are, there are truths that once you have a grasp of them, they begin to change you speedily and more readily. And one of such truths is this. If you can find the love angle to whatever situation that you are faced with, impossibilities become possible. If you can just find the love angle, if you can just find what the love angle stone can give you water. The desert can give you palm trees. As long as the love of God is involved. What we're reading here is a man who had come in contact with the love of God and had come to recognize that as long as the love of his heavenly father is in operation, even if he chooses darkness by himself, he chooses to go and embrace darkness. He says even that darkness of night will become light. We're going to read it again because as simple as it is, it is very profound. So let's read it again. Let's go back to verse 7. In fact, let me show you something in verse 1 because verse 1 is the foundation of everything else that we're reading. It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. What did I tell you on Saturday? What is it? This is Tuesday. So Saturday, I started to tell you about the, the power of the working of what? God's foreknowledge of you. We, we, we kind of cut it short, but just see as we're picking up from where we left off. You know, we read Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that says all things work together for good to those who love God and the called according to his purpose. Right? So basically, the moment you can find the love angle, because God loves everybody. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, but all things don't work together for everybody. Things only work together for good to those who love him in return. And what does it mean to love him in return? Peter says, I love him or we love him because he first loved us. So basically, anyone that has been able to lay hold of the rope that God has sent into the water, of the lifeline of his love that he has cast upon the waters of life, anyone who's grasped that rope and laid hold of it has found the angle of love for whatever situation they might be in. And to such people, everything works together for what? For good. Find love angle, not love handle. Don't let my accent confuse you. I'm talking about the love angle. Just find the angle. Find the perspective that God is coming from. Find the perspective of his love. You see, because most times things are working together for your good, but because you are only looking from the perspective of judgment, you miss out on things that are working together for your good. You see, there was, I mean, hallelujah. Yes, there are times wherein because of what you have done, you expect that you would have a really horrible day. And you're like, oh, man, this, I can just kiss today goodbye. And Satan is going to be like, I think so too. I mean, you might as well. I mean, look at you. It's not even 9 a.m. Look at how many people you have yelled out on the phone. It's not even 8 a.m. And look at all the thoughts on your mind. Oh, come on. The evil of a man's heart are evil continually. You'll be reminded of that. You understand what I mean? And then you begin to anticipate judgment. Even Though God has orchestrated everything with the potential to work together for your good, you are not in a place to receive it because you are not opening your heart to receive the love 
And because you are not welcoming the love, you miss the good. And you start to feel bad. You start to judge yourself. And so, but what do you do if you understand what it means to find the love angle? God loves you so much. And because of his love for you, he took his time to foreknow you. Right? It's not a coincidence that Romans 8.29 came after Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28, first of all, establishes the issue of finding that love angle. That everyone who has been able to respond to the love of the Heavenly Father and recognize that they are called according to His purpose. And what did I tell you? His purpose is, the purpose of God is to find you where you were buried in the crust of the ground that is buried under the two seas that is buried under the darkness and the chaos. He has found you and His purpose is con is to continually lead you so that you can find him also. It is a love story. He's, he, you, you consider yourself his lost family member. Jesus calls you the lost sheep that the father would leave everything behind to seek out. And so when you know that that is his purpose, that that is the ultimate agenda, the reason why he set up all of the scenario that you experienced and this stage that you walk on is so that you can find him like he found you. The moment you understand that, you are championing the sensibility of the love relationship that God seeks to have with us always. And once you champion that thought in your mind, you begin to champion things in life. And so when you read 828 and then go to 829, what do you see? The Bible says, whom he did foreknow. Who is it that he foreknew? And why did he foreknow them? He foreknew you because his love is so anticipatory of, of finding you that he could not wait for you to be formed. He started to simulate your existence even before you were formed. Now, let me tell you something about God. Many of us will keep journals where we write things that have happened. God writes things that have not yet happened so that it can be. It's right there. I just didn't read it. Verse 16. The Bible says, where is it again? Psalms 139, verse 16. It says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Before they happened, you took time to journal about the love experience. Before God made Adam, God already wrote that I will go to him in the cool of the evening and we're just going to chit chat. And then, oh, one evening I came and he had messed up. And I was like, I got you. Because I saw that ahead of time as well. So I allowed for there to have been a sacrifice that was made in eternity. So that regardless of what happens within time, it cannot change that sacrifice. I cannot change my mind about the sacrifice of my lamb. So that's why I got that sacrifice made even before the foundations of the earth. Such a commitment is the power behind your life. And to not know it is to struggle through life. But to know it is to recognize that the power that is is for you. You see how that begins to transform the way you do battle. It transforms the way you overcome temptations. Because when you're not in the mood to debate with Satan, you are so loved that you don't have to worry about it. You can just say, get thee behind me, O oh Satan. Or simply just buy the t-shirt. Not today, Satan. You know, because some of us, we don't know how loved we are, so we think we need to fight in every battle. You know, because these battles are there to exercise you, and sometimes you just don't feel like carrying weight, and so you're just like, not today. I'm just going to roll over and sleep. I used to battle every time I had a bad dream. I would wake up and begin to shkun karabadi, ugali, uziyabarababadunda, even if it's because I ate cheese that was bad. Because sometimes the dreams that you have are not a function of demonic spirits. They are essentially a function of chemical imbalance in your system. And then you wake up and you begin to, to pray until your entire face is covered in spit. I, I used to do that until one day it just occurred to me that, wait a minute. When I was asleep, I was not even conscious of where I was. So I was not the one watching myself and the one who watches me. The Bible says he never sleeps and he never slumbers. And I'm like, it's not right for both of us to be doing night shift at the same time. He's awake so that he can give sleep to his beloved. So I had a horrible dream wherein I was attacked. This, this was actually an attack. And what I did was, I'm like, what I want right now, to be honest, is to sleep. 
And it's not, you see, my action did not stem out of laziness or spiritual complacency. It came out of revelation of God's love. I found the love angle. I rolled over and I slept. And you know how, it, how frustrating that is for, for the enemy. Satan doesn't like to be ignored. And that is the reason why the spirit of Delilah always nags at you. The Bible says Delilah nagged at Samson until he felt like his life was going to leave him. The Bible says Delilah nagged Samson until Samson felt like his breath would depart from him. And then he gave up the goods. The reality of it was that the life that was in Samson was given by God. Samson was filled with the Holy Spirit and that was the reason why he could not even take any alcohol. Because you know, the Bible says do not be filled with wine wherein there is intoxication or dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So I always tell people, if you like to drink a lot of alcohol, knock yourself out, but just don't like being filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time because the two don't go together. You're going to have to choose one. You understand what I mean? And that was the reason why when Elizabeth was pregnant with John, the angel of the Lord Gabriel said to Zechariah, he says, and by the way, tell Elizabeth that she is no longer permitted to drink alcohol simply because the child in her womb is already filled with the Holy Ghost. When Jesus was born, we did not have any record of Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says he was conceived by the power from on high that overshadowed Mary and that he grew up and waxed strong in spirit. But it wasn't until all righteousness was fulfilled did we see that the Holy Spirit came upon him and Jesus was able to remember when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, the Lord, he says, the Bible says, our God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He himself said it. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and he has anointed me. And so we saw that, but John the Baptist could not say that because he was born already filled with the Holy Spirit. I just wanted to say that so that you know that when someone says, oh, don't drink alcohol, it's not because we want you to become a religious freak that loses every social behavior, but it is because you have to choose where you stand. And so when Samson thought that by the nagging of Delilah, he would lose his breath, he thought it was his breath. He didn't know that it was the life of God that was on the inside of him. There is no man who can physically muster that kind of strength except it is by the Holy Spirit. This was a man who busted out three, how many, how many, how many men? I think 300 men or so with the jawbone of a donkey. And these were men who were sword-wielding men. And they didn't just wake up one day and said they were going to become warriors. They had been trained to be warriors. And this guy was using the jawbone of a donkey. If, in fact, if it was the jawbone of a, of a horse, I may have seen the sense in that. But have you seen a donkey before? They don't even look like they've got anything over the horse. But God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And Delilah nagged him to the point wherein he thought he was going to die. And that is the strategy of Satan. Satan keeps nagging you because he wants your attention. And so whenever you have a revelation by God that allows for you to look the other way or turn to the other side and continue your sleep, you drive Satan mad and his cohorts along with him. There are some battles that are worth fighting just for the fun of it. Just because you haven't exercised in a while and you're like, eh, let's deal with these people tonight. You know, and there are times when you go looking for battles because someone ticked you off. I told you there was once that I felt really ticked off in my spirit. I was sitting down in the living room and I was like, okay, I know something isn't right. Lord, show me what it is. And when the Lord showed me what it is and he showed me the Indian doll that had been assigned to frustrate my life in that season, I beat that thing black and blue. I beat it to pop. Remember that story when I was done beating him where there was a signpost? I took the signpost, uprooted it out of the ground and whacked him just to make sure that it was completely done. So there are times when you do things like that. You know, some people do it all the time. People like my wife, you know, my wife never really has a dream wherein she's been attacked, attacked and she sleeps or looks the other way. No, she fights every time. She's a warrior. You know, my hat's off to her. Sometimes I can't be asked. But then again, the moral of the story is that 
the extent to which you can enjoy the peace that has been given to you is the extent to which you have a revelation of the love that brought you that peace. The love of God is everything. And so when you look at verse 1 of Psalms 139, what does it say? It says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. God searched you out because he loves you. It took time to foreknow you because of that love. And so everything David was saying here was pretty much premised or, or, or based on the revelation of God's love for him. And that is the reason why he said in verse, six, verse 11 that if I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. What does that mean? It means that once... I am confident of the love of God. All things begin to work together for my good. Even the darkness will figure out a way to be light. Disappointments would have to become blessings. Oppositions would have to become promotions. No matter what it is, as long as I have an understanding of the love of God, weakness becomes strength. Delay becomes an opportunity for you to come on stage when everybody else is already seated. You see, let me tell you something, having an understanding of the love of God and knowing what is being said to you here by the man of God, David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit allows for you to sit back and let the Lord fight your battles. It allows for you to enjoy the righteousness of God that you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus allows for you to be at peace and allows for you to be able to sing a song of the Holy Ghost simply because when you know that that love never sleeps, it never slumbers. When you know that that love, not only has it seen what you will become, it has also gone ahead to predestine you to make sure that every time you fall, that love picks you up and raises you to a level higher than where you fell from. God knew that Adam was going to fall and that was the reason why he had already prepared the lamb of sacrifice. And so when Adam came to God, I mean, when God came to Adam and Adam was hiding, God was like, okay, you think you can hide from this love? Not today, Adam. Because God already knows that he wasn't going anywhere until he was loved in return. I told people the other day, I said, not even sin was able to separate Adam from the love of God. You know, because sometimes you think, okay, you know what, this God, the way he loves me, and I know that he doesn't love sin, so maybe if I hide in sin. No, the Bible says God is too holy to behold sin. And so if you go and hide in sin, it's not a biggie for him because he will still see you because you are the apple of his eyes. So he's not looking at you through the sin, he's looking at you from within you. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord with which he searches the inward parts of his belly. I put this to you today that God's love for you has all the attributes of God himself because God is love. And so that love is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. The way God is going to love you when you become more spiritually mature, always ready to forgive, studying the word of God as you should, witnessing as you should, praying as you should, loving others as you should, all of that which you are going to become maybe in the next seven years if the Lord delays is coming. God already sees it today and is ready to deal with you on the basis of who you will become. Don't sell yourself short. You see, when a man, the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. People leave millions of dollars for children that are just two years old. Not because at two they can spend it, but because they know one day they're going to become 32 and they would need it. And that is the way God operates. He's not just dealing with you based on where you are today. Why am I telling you all of these things? Come with me to the book of Jeremiah. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 11. We're going to quickly touch on verse 1. It says... The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, hear the words of this covenant and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
Now, please, let's pay close attention here. And say to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, cursed is the man who does not obey the words of this covenant. God is like anybody that does not obey the words of this covenant, I am coming for them. Let me say that again. You see, the way God sees covenants, he sees covenants as himself. And so if you stand against the covenant, you are standing against God, and he says, I am that rock that grinds into powder. The Bible says it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the Almighty God. When it comes to the way God loves you, he, he has a covenant of love with you, and he is very fierce about that covenant. So what is it that can separate you from the love of God? Tribulations? No. Trials? No. Peril? No. Things in heaven? No. Things on the ground? No. Things beneath the ground? Paul says, I have seen it all, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Because God already places, he already placed a curse on whatever tries to come against the covenant, and the curse that God placed on it is such that it cannot stand. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11. That was 11 verse 1. Now let's go to 1 11. We're going to take you from the angle of a palindrome today. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11. And look at what it says. It says, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I say, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well. I am ready to perform my word. What makes, what makes the Lord ready to perform his word? The moment Jeremiah was able to see the almond tree. God is ready to make everything work together for your good the moment you're able to see his love. The moment you're able to see from the love angle, he is ready to perform his word. And what is his word? His covenant. And what is that covenant? His love for you. We have wasted too much time trying to do things to earn his love wherein he has already given to us his love freely so that we can have peace and have joy and have life that is more abundant. One of the areas that I sought the Lord once this came to me that we needed to see a transformation in is our ability to quickly get to trust without spending many days worrying. You know, eventually some of us end up trusting God because we have exhausted all of our own ways of help. Let me say that slowly. Some of us, while we have options, that uncle out of town, that friend that is always so willing, or that little plan of yours to overcome the obstacle, while you have all of those alternatives, you don't fully trust God. But once you have exhausted all of those things, you're like, okay, God, well, it's not working, so what you got? So it takes you a while to get to peace. And those days are now gone. How do you get them back? But with this insight, you can get to trust more readily. I'm going to show you something here very quickly in the book of Matthew chapter 27. Actually, Matthew 27, verse 9. We're doing a lot of scripture reading today. And I hope you can go back and try and memorize these scriptures or just at least meditate on them. The Bible says in Matthew 27 verse 9, Then was fulfilled that was spoken by who? Jeremiah the prophet. The same Jeremiah saying, And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him who was prized, whom they of the children of Israel prized, and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. They put a price on Jesus and they thought he was worth only 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> Let me tell you something, folks. Many of us will put a price on the love of God. And what is the price? Why did they give that money to Judas Iscariot? They gave that to Judas Iscariot for the service that he provided. Many of us, we limit the love of God to the service that we have provided. If I am not serving God 
and doing all of the things that is written, then I feel like that love of God is limited to that which I have done. Wrong. In fact, you will never do more if you think like that or you will never do enough, I meant to say. But when you know that there is no price that can be placed on his love and his love is no payment for your service, but his love is a gift, then what happens is your ability to trust him and the power that is made available through that process to actually get work done becomes infinity. And that is how people get things done for God, not by, not by servitude, but by being Confident in his love. Let's not put a price on the love of God because such things, you know what they do? They are not reward. They become a burden. When, when Judas took that money, it became a burden and that drove him into the grave. We're going to read one more scripture and then I'm going to explain a couple of things. Come with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 7 verse 12. And then we're going to read a couple of things. In fact, I want to read to us a scripture from Hosea. Hosea, hopefully we'll get to it today. So Isaiah chapter 7, verse 12. But he has said, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Verse 14. Therefore the Lord, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you and shall call his name Emmanuel. Jesus did not come because we asked for him. Oh, y'all didn't get it. <laughs> Let's read it again. Ahaz, which means the one that has, because the one that has, more shall be given to him, right? So what do you have? From the foundation of time, what you have is God's attention and God's interest and God's love. So when he has had a revelation of the fact that, wait a minute, I don't even have to ask. He says, I will not ask, neither will I test the Lord. The Bible says, God was like, okay, now you will receive a virgin. And the reason why it has to be a virgin is because God is like, I don't even need your seed. I don't even need your contribution. <laughs> you see, I was somewhere while we were in worship. I realized after a while that my hands had been up and it felt like I just put them up. And I'm like, wow, I remember when Moses' hand was up, after a while they became weak and the Lord asked that to send people to go and help him. And I'm like, here I am. I haven't even asked for help, but they were already holding up my hand. You see, let me tell you something. The Bible says we, we don't even know what we need to ask for as we should. Romans chapter 8 verse 26. The Bible says, but the Spirit helps us in all of our infirmities. For we do not know what we should ask for as we ought to, but the Spirit is already on the job making intercessions for you with groanings that cannot be uttered. I like to pray and I like to pray a lot, but I do not for once kid myself that I can take the place of Jesus, the one who lives to intercede for me. Most of my prayer is to fulfill all righteousness because there is nothing that I need that Jesus has not already brought to the attention of the Father. He says, I will not ask, I will not test the Lord. Do you know that many of us, we, we, not only do we ask for what we have already been given, we test God. I said, so I'm going to increase my offering to $20 and see if they can promote me at work. Some people will say, you know, I'm going to stop paying my tithes. Maybe then after that, my children will be better behaved or my wife will start to cook for those who like food and who cannot cook themselves. You see, what do we do? We're testing the Lord. Whereas the man of God, he has, he says, I don't have to ask and I'm not even going to test. 
And the Lord says, that is the spirit. I want you to have that attitude because it is a free gift. I know what you need even before you ask. And I know how to deliver it better than you can receive it. And so I'm going to make it happen by the ministry of a virgin. And ultimately, what I'm really trying to do is to let you know that I am with you. And that I am for you. And that even before the substance of your being came to be, I have already loved you and I sought you out. From eternity past, I found you in the archives of time and I showered my love on you. God is so eager to love you and to show it because he wants you to know that he is there. You see, somebody who loves you would let you know they love you. You understand what I mean? Because the moment you have a revelation of that love and you're able to reciprocate that love, then the circle is now complete. And that is the reason why God says, you don't have to be begging me for things. You don't have to, yes, don't get me wrong. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. But I want you to ask with the mind of fulfilling all righteousness because Jesus says your heavenly father knows what you need even before you ask. So don't ask as if you are teaching God his job. Don't ask and say, God, you know that if you don't promote me, people at work will laugh at me because I keep telling them that I'm a Jesus kid and now everyone is getting promoted and I am not leaving where I've been for seven years. Now, are you teaching God how to demonstrate his love toward you? The one who already came up with a plan of exactly how to show you his love and wrote it in his book so that no one can question it. No one can say after a while that, oh, well, maybe, maybe Chris doesn't deserve that. And God is like, well, sorry, it's too late. I already wrote it and I signed it in blood. Because if it is written, it is binding. And so let us begin to recondition our expectations. Let your expectations not be based on your performance, but let your expectation be based on his performance, his ability to what? To perform his word. He says, go and tell them, I will perform my word. Okay, now we're going to read that Hosea chapter 2. Because actually we're just going to read uh, one verse. Let's just, I think it's Hosea, Hosea chapter 2, verse 9. Hosea chapter 2, verse 9, it says, Therefore I will return and take away my grain in its time and my new wine in its season. And I will take back my wool and my linen given to cover and nakedness. Verse 10 says, Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall deliver her from my hand. God says, I was the one who gave her wool, but I am coming to remove my wool from her. Because the wool that I gave to her was not to cover lewdness, but she is trying to cover her weaknesses rather than exposing them. And so I will take it away. You see, many of the reasons why we struggle to have fullness in certain areas of life is because God knew you were going about it the wrong way and he wants to expose you so that you can learn to trust solely in him and not in your ability. He says, I gave you that wool, I'm going to take it back. I gave you that grain, I am going to take it back. Because you are obsessing with things that I've given to you without paying attention to the heart with which I gave it. You know, we complain about not getting promoted at work, forgetting that it was God who gave you that work. And God is like, okay, maybe if I took that opportunity away, then you will realize your lewdness. Lewdness means to be sexually promiscuous. And whenever God is talking about people not trusting him as they should, he uses the word lewdness or adultery or fornication because it's like you're not supposed to put your trust in another but me. And so whenever you're trusting in yourself and you're trusting in things, God is like, okay, we need to fix this problem. We need to expose where your heart really is. And I say that today because of the fact that, you know, many of us, 
we have been stripped and God wants to cover us again, but he doesn't want to cover us until we know why we were stripped. We need to know that it is not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. You see, as I was speaking just right now, I just saw this scripture from Revelation chapter 12, verse 19. And maybe that's the last one before we explain, like I was saying to you, that I want to explain to you a couple of things. And I'm going to use a lot of examples from the things that Paul said. So we may not read them, but we're just going to reference them as we go along. But you see this Revelation chapter 12, verse 19 has one word that I want us to run with. Revelation 12, 19. Revelation 12, actually it's 12, verse 9, not 19. Revelation 12, verse 9. And where is it? It says, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The word that I want us to hold on to is deceive the whole world. You see, the Lord revealed to me that the reason why many of us have difficulty in embracing the love of God is because of the way the world system has deceived us into thinking that the love of God or love of any kind has to be earned. You see, deceived the what? The whole world. When you tell people the way the love of God really works, they struggle with it because nothing else in the whole world works like the love of God. The way the love of God works. And Satan was the mastermind of that. And the reason why I took us to this particular Revelation 12, 9 is because the Bible says this is the same serpent that was in the garden. And why is God referencing the serpent that was in the garden? Because when God made man, Adi, he made him in his image and in his likeness. He already made man in his image and in his likeness. And the serpent came and he says, oh, you want to be like God? You need to eat this fruit. That which is already yours. Man did not cry out from the door and say, hey God, make me like you. God chose to make God man like himself because of his love. Because the best way to love is to love as yourself. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And so the only way we can experience the fullness of God if, if, is only if we are as himself. So God made, and I've told you this before, I've taught you this before. When God gave me a revelation of his love, it looked like a throne of gold and the shape of the seat was the shape of a man. And God says, that's, that's my place in your heart. He had to make you in his image and in his likeness. But some of us become so full of ourselves that we don't leave any room for God. You see, God said, I am warning you, my love works different to anything else that is in the world because the prince of this world, who is the same serpent that was in the garden, the serpent of old, has deceived the world into thinking that they have to ask for my love and that they have to do things to earn my love. So God was telling us, through the experience of Adam and Eve, that we do not have to do anything to earn that love. Because what he told them was if they ate of the fruit, they would be like God. And because they were already like God, eating of the fruit just meant that they had to become something else. Because if I'm already in the house and Satan convinces me that I needed to open the door and go into the house, where will I find myself? Outside the house, because I am already in the house. So if I open this door and I cross the portal, I will then be outside. They were already like God and Satan opened the door for them to be outside of God. You are already loved by God. You don't have to do anything to earn his love. While you're busy earning his love, God sees it as lewdness. Because now you're trusting a different process than the one that he instituted. The fundamental of your relationship with God every morning that you wake is to first of all remind yourself of his love. And just say, you know what? It doesn't matter how I feel right now. What I should be feeling is the love of my heavenly father. Even if you're over 40 and you wake up and it's almost as if your back forgot to wake up. You know, sometimes you wake up when you're getting older and it's almost like your back is still asleep because you want to get up and, and your back is like still trying to wake up and it's like, oh my God, we need to go, wakey, wakey. 
remember that the love of God is always there, what? The name of the love of God is what? Emmanuel. It is always with you. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of time. He will be with you always. So I want to encourage you, don't fall for the trick of the serpent of old who is telling you you have to do this to earn the love. And in closing, and before we break bread, I want to encourage us with some of the things that Apostle Paul said about the love of God. He has already, I've already quoted one to us that says what shall separate us from the love of God. He says all things work together for good to them that love God and accord according to his purpose. But in, Revel in Romans chapter 3, he says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans chapter 3, if you read chapter 3, chapter 5, he talks about the fact that while we were yet sinners and even enemies of God, God still loved us because you saw him as an enemy, but he saw you as a child, as his own. Let me say that again. You were the one who saw him as your enemy. He never sees you as a foe. He sees you as his beloved. How many of us today are still seeing God as the one keeping us from breakthroughs? How many of us today are still seeing God as the one delaying to bless us? How many of us today are still seeing God as the one that has, that has continued to deprive you of that husband that you so desperately want and is the one that is depriving you of answers to prayers? Do you believe that you have the gift of the interpretation of dreams, but in the last five dreams that you interpreted, only one of them was accurate? How many, people, how many of us continue to see that we think that God is the one that is keeping us from it and God is like, it is not I. I want you to have everything. That is the reason why I have given you everything. You need to see me as I see you. You need the perspective of the love of God. It takes the perspective of the love of God on all subject matters and on all areas, in all areas, for us to enjoy the fullness of what he has for us. One more example from Apostle Paul, and this was even the beginning of the message, so to speak, as the Lord was dealing with me a couple of days ago. You see, the Lord showed me this moment where I'm, wherein I am talking to you about who you are and who you are not. Who you are and who you are not. See, the devil is very crafty. He has a way of creating an avatar that looks like you and then convincing you that that is you. How many people remember the game Prince of Persia? Only Charles, really? I'm not that old. I know people here who are about my age. Come on, you remember Prince of Persia? Because that's what it's called, Prince of Persia. That game where that guy keeps running around trying to, he was kind of like, he was supposed to be like Aladdin, saving the princess. Anyway, go online and Google it. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm not explaining that any further. I'm sorry. But in that game, I used to play that game a lot. And one day I was playing it and I got to a level, and some of you, okay, maybe just Charles. Charles, you will remember this, where you go through a mirror and then you become two people a shadow of yourself, an avatar of sort of yourself comes out. And the whole idea of it is you may be trying to control that one while the real you walks into the trap. And the devil does that all the time. I, I will never forget the first day that I got to that level, almost every hair on my head stood up. I was so scared. But the reality of it is it happens in our daily lives wherein the enemy would come and paint a picture of who he wants you to be, and sometimes Satan can be very convincing. I, I say sometimes because of the fact that if you know the word and you know who you are, you're not going to fall for his antics. But there are times where he can be pretty convincing. And so this is what Satan does when he comes. He paints a picture of someone that looks like you, and then he shows you all of what they're doing and all of what should happen to them, and then sends you into a pandemonium. And someone is like, well, Satan may have done that to other people, but not to you. Let me give you Paul's example. In Romans chapter 7, Paul said something about his own struggle. He says, the things that I will to do, I do not. But the things that I will not to do is what I practice. He didn't even say is what I do. 
You see, that which I will to do, I don't even accidentally do it, not even one time. He said, but that which I will not to do is what I practice. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let me ask you a question. Can a body of death come from your heavenly father? Jesus says, why seek you the living among the dead? And so Paul had a revelation that, wait a minute, the entire time I thought it was I that kept doing all this evil stuff. He said, but the reality of it is this is a body of death. The light of the love of God exposed to him the avatar that Satan had created. In the flesh. And that avatar, and so you know what he says? He says, yet not I, but sin that dwells in my members. He recognized, oh, wait a minute, that old serpent has managed to create an image of me that it is not I. He says, that which I will to do, I do not. He says, yet not I, but sin that reigns in my members. He says, because that one is obeying the laws of sin, whereas the real me obeys the laws of God. That is according to the inward man. Satan creates an image of you that is not worthy of the blessing that you're asking for, and he puts you to work to earn it first, whereas it's already paid for. It takes having an understanding of the love of God to see the real you and see it different from the avatar that the enemy created by partnering with the flesh. The Holy Spirit partnered with your spirit to give birth to this new creation. And Satan was watching. And so when the Holy Spirit was done making you a new creation in Christ Jesus, he went into own secret lab and partnered with your flesh to create an alter ego. It looks like you, it talks like you. It sounds like you, but it is not you. You need the flashlight of the love of God to expose the emptiness of that other image. You are the one that your heavenly father paid all that sacrifice, all that price for. You were the one that Christ died for. And that was the reason why when Paul was very confident that what he was saying was the truth, he went on to say, there is therefore now no condemnation to me because I am the one that is in Christ Jesus. I do not walk according to this avatar that is in the flesh, but I walk according to the spirit. And that law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. We, once again, ladies and gentlemen, have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father. My submission to you today is that you need to put to death that body that was created through the consciousness of sin and guilt to keep you away from the fullness of the love of your heavenly father. Every time of the day, God is expecting to hear from you. That's the reason why he says, pray without ceasing. God wants you to pray always. But if you keep wondering whether you are able to talk to him because of what you have done or not, then he can't hear from you and he wants to hear from you all the time. And that is the reason why he says concerning the spirit that is in you, the Bible says whatsoever is born of God does not sin. And you're like, oh, but I sinned. I sinned. So am I not born of, born of God? You are born of God, but that avatar is not. And you just need to learn how to separate yourself from it. As we break bread today, I want us to lay hold of the power of God that is in here today, which is the potency of his word that is living and powerful. The Bible says the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it is able to pierce through the dividing membrane between soul and spirit. Most of us, where we are connected and conjoined with that avatar is in our subconscious mind. Because subconsciously, you keep seeing yourself as the one that needs to beg to receive. Subconsciously, you keep seeing yourself as the one that needs to repent to receive. Subconsciously, you keep seeing yourself as that one that needs to impress to be blessed. Subconsciously, you keep seeing yourself as not worthy of the grace of God because of who you are and how you have been. And so I want you to apply the ax to the root today and separate yourself in this holy deliverance from any avatar that makes you forget that you are loved. As we break bread today, I want you to remember Jesus. 
And I want you to remember, because Jesus said, as often as you have the opportunity, do this in remembrance of me. Remind yourself that Jesus came through a virgin. Not because we asked for him, not because we put God to test and he needed to prove himself, but because he just chose within himself to show us his love. It is critical for us to remember so that whenever that temptation comes again, whenever that thought comes to disqualify you from the grace of God, you can just laugh at it and say, you know what? I am loved and highly favored. I am loved with an everlasting love. And that is the reason why I am more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus, because he loves me. That's what the Bible says, not because I'm good at fighting with a sword, not because I'm great at scaling over the enemy, but simply because he loves me. That's why I'm more than a conqueror. So why do I need to remember? I need to remember so that I am always walking with the consciousness of the love of God and I'm always able to see that love angle. You have to see it. Jeremiah, what do you see? I see the almond, I see the almond tree. And God is like, yeah, bingo. Now I am ready to perform all of what I say. So he's asking you today, Ziesta, what do you see? I see that you love me. Now I am ready to make everything work together for your good. He's asking you today, Shayla, what do you see? I see that you have perfected all that concerns me. And he says, now I am ready to send you to take hold of your possession. Simply because it is not your performance, it is his performance. He says, I will perform my word. Just because now you see it. Now you get it. Is God good? Praise the Lord. Alrighty. We're going to break bread very quickly. And I did not announce any of these scriptures as officially the breaking bread scriptures. So I'll give you one very quickly. Come with me to Genesis chapter 37, verse 2, verse 7, verse 9, and maybe verse 14, if the clock does not stop ticking. 37, or if it keeps thinking, I meant to say. We start from verse 2, and I'm just going to read them very quickly, and, and I want you to put them together in your spirit and let them be the hand with which you hold the cup of the blood of Jesus tonight. Verse 2 says, this is the history of Jacob. Genesis chapter 37, verse 2. Actually, let's just read verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. When we were praying today while worship was on, I had a thought. I was going to keep it to myself. But when I came up here, the Lord said, I am with them, but are they with me? Do you remember when I came up here, when I started saying I think the band was probably still up on the stage at the time saying that the Lord is with us. We need to be with him. We need to pray, be present with him with our passion. We need to be present with him in attention and in, and in attentiveness. God is with you. That's why he sent you, Jesus Christ, to the ministry of that Virgin Mary so that you can call him Emmanuel. God is with us. But God wants to know if you are with him. He wants you to say, Lord, here I am. I know you are with me, and now I am with you. The reason why this is important is because of something else that the Lord revealed to me. I'll touch upon it very quickly, but I'm not going to dwell on it. I said it when I was speaking to Shayla, but I didn't want to go too deep so that you don't think it's just a word for Shayla. The reality of it is that there are many of us in here today that God needs to send us to go and feed our brothers. Some people need healing, and you need to take the bread of healing to them. Some people need for depression to be broken over their lives, and you are the one that God wants to send. God wants to send, and God is with you. He has already equipped, with, with, he equipped you with all of what you need, but the trouble is that you're not yet with him. And so when Jacob called for J Joseph, he says, I have an assignment for you. And what did Joseph say? Joseph says, I am with you. Here I am. Are you present with God? You see, there were so many other scriptures that I wanted us to read, but the Holy Spirit took me to that one for your sake to save you time and to just bring that which was at the beginning again at the end for your sake that you may be complete in him, lacking nothing. So he, Joseph, said to the father, 
here I am. I want you to say to the Father, I am with you. You're with me because you love me. I'm with you because I love you too. When you love someone, you stay with them. When you love someone, you cannot get too much of their attention and they cannot get too much of yours. The Lord is with you, stay with him. Let your thought be fixed on him. The Lord is with you, stay with him. As we break bread today, I want you to say, Lord, you are with me, thank you, I am with you also. I will not desert you like the disciples deserted Jesus because I am not where they were. I am under a new and everlasting covenant. Even when it doesn't look like it, I will stay with you. Though you slay me, I will trust you. Hallelujah. I say to you today for communion house, this is day seven. It is day seven. It is the day of rest. You have labored. You have run hither and, and you've run here and there. And the Lord is saying, I bring you rest because I want to bring you into my rest. I speak over you today in the mighty name of Jesus that your spirit, soul and body will find rest in the lover of your soul. Because you don't have to test him anymore by trying to use the darkness as your covering. Even though you know that that darkness will become light, you don't need to test him. You don't need to fly on the wings of the dawn to the ends of the earth to see whether the love of God is there because that love of God is Christ Jesus and he is with you always because he's the one that is, the one that was and is to come. So stop asking, stop testing. Just let him love you and then you love him in return. This thing is happening supernaturally as I speak. You will just find that your burdens are getting taken off of your shoulders. Some of us will sleep better beginning tonight simply because now we know that he cares for us. Some of us from today on will not even be able to worry even though we try because you, are, you have already gone so far ahead into his love that worry cannot get to you where you're at. I encourage you today in the mighty name of Jesus that it's been, a lot, it's been a long time since you found yourself smiling while praying. You're about to start smiling again while you pray. You're about to start laughing again in his presence. In fact, some of you will have so much rest that you will sleep and fall asleep while you pray. When you find yourself falling asleep while you pray after this message, it's not because you're not a serious Christian or religious a believer, but it is because he's manifesting that love to you even in your physical body and in the calmness of your mind. Come into his rest communion house. It is day seven. Now the beauty of day seven is this. What is the day that follows day seven? And what is the number eight? It says, behold, I do a new thing. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I want you to take off the body of the Lord Jesus and drink of his blood in remembrance of him rejoicing and smiling as you do because he loves you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I call you Ephraim. You are the fruitful ones. I call you Ephraim. You are the fruitful ones. The Bible says none shall be barren in the land. And so if you have not been fruitful in business, in your career, in your marriage, this is what new thing God is talking about. You know, when the Lord says, behold, I do a new thing because you have come to day seven, you will wake up on day eight. And the Lord begins to do a new thing. He says, that eighth thing that I am doing is a new thing of abundance by fruitfulness in the mighty name of Jesus. And now the Lord says to me that as my arms were lifted up, that I should also lift up the arms that are weak. Because there is a weakness and a heaviness that I kept sensing throughout today's meeting. And it is because of the fact that the prince of this world wants to continue to nag at us with all kinds of burdens that are not even ours to carry. And many of us have become weary emotionally. We have become weary psychologically 
simply because of the bombardment of the things of the world. The princes of the air have completely taken over the airwaves to pollute our minds with thoughts and notions of isolation. Many of us have been convinced by Satan that we are alone in this world and we have to struggle, we have to fight. Many of us have been convinced that we are just not good enough for certain things and that we're just, we're just not, we just don't know how to do certain things. Some of us have even concluded that maybe we're just horrible at life. And the Lord has sent me to you today to let you know that every handwriting of the ordinances of Satan concerning you have been blotted out. And that even the ones that you yourself have written that are not in accordance to his covenant, he has cursed every attempt at defeating you. Because that covenant prevails. It is a covenant thing. Hallelujah. We're just going to do one more thing real quick and then I'm going to hand over to Alan. And the one more thing that we're going to do is I want to encourage you, if you can, get up and just walk around and march around. You see, and just march around. And I tell you one of the things that we are doing right now as we're marching around is because we're saying we are no longer where we were. We are getting up and we are taking possession of what God has for us because we know we don't have to sweat for it. It has already been given to us by his love. And in him I live and move and have my being. I am in his love and I can never get out of his love. I am walking in love. I am walking in victory. I live a life of freedom and favor. I know who I am in Christ Jesus. I possess my possession for whatever the soul of my foot shall step, it shall be mine. And so as I walk around in him, his heart is mine. And my heart is his in the name of Jesus. Communion house, praise the Lord. Communion house, are you ready? Are you ready to lay hold of his love? Praise the Lord. Come on, let's celebrate the Lord. God is good. What a night tonight. Okay. <laughs> Ain't you glad you came? God is good. A night of deliverance, of lifting. I don't know about you, but I needed to hear that. God is good. The given details are on the screen. Let's give in faith, give in obedience. Just give in, in loving our maker. Make it a love offering tonight. Because he has done great things. Oh, come on, sis. I hear that. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> Say, oh, we about to hand you the microphone, sis. God is good. Amen. To our family online, those here, dollar sign, communion house, at Cash App, at Communion House, PayPal, as well as the Zelle information. If you need an envelope, it's over here by our dear brother Kenyatta. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise for you alone are worthy. Yes, sir. You know that your hand needs to be lifted up. You're saying, or rather, as I am saying, this resonates with you. I, wanna, I want to lift your hand up physically in this place to help your faith. For the Lord said to me as I sat there that I didn't just say to you to say to them. I also said to you to lift up the arm that is weak. And I just know that the Lord will have me do this. It might not be your thing, Brother James, but I would encourage you to come forward because I want to lift up your arm. 
You see, when it comes to the things of the love of God for you and the example that you are meant to be to others, there is more that God wants to deliver through you. Do you mind coming forward and just let me, letting me lift your arm up? I just see myself doing that for you today. Just helping to lift up your arm. Alan, come and help me hold this microphone. In the mighty name of Jesus. And I just want you to lift up your hands. Don't mind just turning around and facing everybody. I want to lift up your hand. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because a new spirit and a new heart have you for your son tonight. And as these arms have been lifted up, Father, I thank you because your glory will descend upon him and he will begin to see through your eyes and see as you see, beginning with himself in a new way. Let him see that glory that you have sprinkled upon him as you have sprinkled the stars across the firmament. Let him see that light that radiates around him even as you commanded for there to be light. In the mighty name of Jesus, this arm is up in your love, in full surrender to your grace. Lord, this man is with you as you are with him. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Praise the Lord, sir. Thank you. You may return to your seat. I want to pray for one more person. You've reached the breaking point. Okay, I'm going to pray for the breaking point people different. I want to just, let me, Z, come, let me pray for you. The Bible says, he that waters himself must be watered. And the Bible says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. Oh, yes, the liberal soul shall be made fat. You see, when you shared that testimony with me, that was the word that came into my spirit. Boom. That he that waters himself must be watered. I received it for myself, first of all. But then I know when you were talking to me again today that you have indeed watered. You took that which you, you grabbed from the presence of your heavenly father and you shared it with others without even, you shared it the way the Lord showed it to me. You know, I wasn't there when you were talking to these people, but the Lord showed it to me that you shared it with them as though you were giving it to them, even if there was none left for you. You gave it all because their deliverance was paramount in your eyes. And the Lord said to me, that is the Joseph that said, here I am. You fed them without holding anything back. And Father, with the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you because this woman shall be watered herself. And the Lord said to me, you are in the water. You see, this is not just a sprinkling. The Lord has you soaked in that water of renumeration, that water of restoration and replenishing, that water of reward. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Who is that person at the breaking point? You have come to a point where you're like, okay, something has to definitely shift. I need things to shift. I need it to shift like yesterday. I'm done. Praise the Lord. God is done. Well, well in this moment, but he's not done with you, but I'm done here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Where are my breaking point people? Let's do it real quick. Like breaking point, like, yeah. Yeah, like, like Jesus, show up now. Find them in the mighty name of Jesus. O kukulu tuale meme krumendos kukudun de yala brandish to you sbrobobokodos la fruta bende yaba. Can somebody else take over for my wife? I want to pray for her as well. So if Kayla and Shayla, okay, you got it. You just. So these are my breaking point people. Okay, how bad do you want it? But do you know that no matter how much you want it, you don't want it as much as God wants to give it. So your ability to receive today is tied to his willingness to give, not your own willingness to suck. So I know you have been pushed to the wall and you need a breakthrough. You do need that breakthrough. But let me tell you something. The one who forged the breakthrough even before you were formed is been waiting for you to receive it. And so Lord, let it be by your own will. Let it be by your will. And I'm going to start from Dioni here. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, 
This is a defining moment for you and for you all. I pull you into your new season by the drawing power of the love of God. Not by your ability to pull, but his ability to draw. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, so cruel. I just place, I place my hands on you again because the Lord says you need to carry this grace for someone else too. So when that other person finally shows up, they won't draw you back because they have now a connection to the heart of the Father to draw them in. So you don't have to worry. They may not be where you're at, but they will be where they need to be because now there is a grace that has already been given to the help that they need. So just continue to carry that in the mighty name of Jesus. You have been pulled in by your heavenly father for goodness, for grace. He's pulling you in for breakthrough. He's pulling you in in the mighty name of Jesus. Nothing in you will rebel against the love of your heavenly father. In every way, you will open and surrender and you will let him be seen in you at all times, even in deep obedience in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, you have been drawn into the love of the Father for all things to work together for your good. You have been drawn in for all things to work together for your good, for you to receive because of his fullness have you all received Grace for grace, in the mighty name of Jesus. Where's Nancy? Grace for grace, in the mighty name of Jesus. Grace for grace, grace for grace. Now, hallelujah. Now, I'm going to lay my hands on you just one more time. If you can slot yourself in there somewhere, Nancy, God be with you. Lord, in Jesus' name, thank you for you and for others. Breakthrough. 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 Breakthrough, 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 breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. Breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. Breakthrough. Hallelujah. Breakthrough in the mighty name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah. Marabodo se se de liara mamandari akaraboske tis le krebolodo sendale ala mamansa. Father, we give you praise in the mighty name of Jesus. Alan. Alrighty, God bless you. Please be seated and let's close out the service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, oh, Shati, come on. Come on, somebody. We're going to keep on in our giving. <laughs> God is good. Father, we give you praise for this time of meeting, this time of visitation, oh God, of ex experiencing your love. These testimonies, indeed, that come forth of what you have done by your love, by finding pleasure in us, oh God. There is none like you. Let these offerings, oh God, be found pleasing in your sight as we give in love, as we give in faith, as we give in obedience, oh God, as we give just because who you are, oh God. There was none like you. We thank you so much for this encounter on tonight. We love you, oh God. We bless your name. All glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is good. I'm excited to hear y'all's testimonies because I'm excited to give mine. All right. Y'all have a blessed night.